Well, the book of First Chronicles. <clears throat> I'm going to talk first about the author and the date very briefly. Um, this was, of course, originally one book. First and Second Chronicles was originally just Chronicles, and um, it's had a few different names over the years. Um, but it was written sometime between probably 500 B.C. and 400 B.C., and scholars go back and forth as to when exactly that was. But many believe it was written soon after Israel's return to the land under the decree of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in 538 B.C. Um, the southern kingdom of Judah was taken captive in 586. They were ransacked and led out into um, Babylon. But then the world power shifted, and Persia became the dominant world power. And King Cyrus in Persia um, gave this edict that people could return to their lands and worship their gods. And in fact, you can go to the British Museum today, if you want to get on a plane tonight, and go see what is called the Cyrus Cylinder. It's a cylinder about the size of a football with inscriptions on it. And, um, and it, it, they think that this was a copy of the actual decree from that time that went out through the, the land from King Cyrus, decreeing that the subjugated peoples could return to their homeland and worship their gods. And um, in fact, I was in the British Museum many years ago on a study tour and, and looked over, and it happened to be there. We weren't even looking at that. We were looking at other things. The British Museum is truly a sight to behold. We're off topic now, but I'm listening to the, the tour guide talk about something over there, and I looked in the glass case next to me and went and started tapping people and recognized it from textbooks. And so you can, you can Google while I talk, wait till a boring moment, and Google the Cyrus Cylinder. And you'll see it there. You should read about it tonight. And so sometime after this, in 538 B.C., the Israelites begin returning. And you know this. They did this under Ezra and Nehemiah. They go back to rebuild first the temple, then the walls. And sometime after that period, this book of Chronicles is written. Now, there are names and, um, of people that lived later than 538, later even than 500, more like in the mid to early 400s. And so we know that this book has material that was added at that time. So either it was written sometime like in 450 to 400, or it was written over a period of decades, like many great pieces of literature like these books were. They were, they were written and they were edited and they were compiled. And so as more kings, for instance, lived and died, then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then there would have been material added until it reached its final form, probably sometime around 400 B.C. So that's a little bit about the probable author. A uh, date, in terms of author, we don't know. And typically people just say the chronicler, <laughs> the one who chronicled, you know. But the traditional view forever has been Ezra. Um, this is what the Jewish historians believe. Um, is that Ezra wrote Chronicles and that Ezra and then Nehemiah kind of came right after it um, as one work, sort of like Luke and Acts. And in fact, the last, um, oh, I think it's the last two verses of Second Chronicles are essentially identical to the first four verses of Ezra, just kind of numbered differently and slight changes in wording. But I mean, it's the same. You can go and look at them. And there's other stylistic similarities that led people for really most of the last 2,000 years to assume that Ezra wrote them. I don't know. I'm not, I, I can't say one way or the other. It sounds like a great view because it's simple. Um, but if not, then it was almost certainly a priest and a contemporary of Ezra, someone from his immediate circles. Because it is a priestly document beginning to end. Um, it's concerned with the temple and the functioning of the temple. And I mean the minute inner workings at times of, of temple worship. It's concerned with the lineage of David, you'll see as we go. So if it wasn't written by Ezra, it was written by a priest who was a contemporary of Ezra. But why was it written? This matters tremendously because it helps us understand um, the occasion and purpose. If Samuel and Kings were written as a selective history to explain to Jews living in exile where they went wrong, well, then Chronicles was written as a spiritual history to Jews returning from exile to explain how they can rebuild Israel rightly. That's why this was written. Just as Deuteronomy is a more spiritual, theological retelling 
at the end of the Pentateuch. Covers the same, much of the same material, uh, but in a theological, spiritual way, explaining the significance. And just like the Gospel of John is sort of a spiritual and theological retelling of the life of Jesus at the end of the Gospels, well, so Chronicles is essentially a, a more spiritual, theological retelling of the history of Israel. Specifically, First and Second Chronicles covers Second Samuel through Second Kings, those three books. Um, but it does it from a priestly, spiritual perspective. It gives sort of a more of a God's eye view on the history of Israel. In terms of an outline, in the broadest possible strokes, the first nine chapters are genealogies. It's not the most riveting. Um, you can read that at night if you're having a hard time falling asleep. Although the Jews in their day would have paid very careful attention to this. Um, when you get to these parts of the Bible, like in the book of Joshua, and it seems so dull, and you say, why is this here? Well, that was like reading, um, that was like reading the will of a recently deceased wealthy relative. They read it carefully because there was tribal land allotments in there. This is their family name. This is their great-great-grandfather's name, and they're descended directly, and now they have a claim on that land. This lineage mattered mattered tremendously to them. And then specifically, the first nine chapters are David's royal line. Here is King David. Now, there's plenty of other people. You have others from Israel whose lineage is being traced, but really the whole thing centers around David. And what you get in chapter 10 to the end then is David's reign. You get his royal line or his lineage, and then you get his reign. And so another way to think about First Chronicles especially is David. This is the life of David, but told from sort of a God's eye view. And it's important to remember um, why it's written to these Jews coming back into their land. And so it has a very different tone. I, I put this chart in here um, uh, from a, a book. I want to walk through this real quick because it shows something of the difference between Samuel and Kings and then the Chronicles. We'll just go down these these uh, columns that can, if Samuel and Kings is the continuation of Israel's history from the United Kingdom to the two captivities, well then Chronicles focuses just on the southern kingdom and the Davidic line. If you read First and Second Chronicles, we're going to talk about First Chronicles tonight, but you notice the northern kingdom is strangely missing. They are discussed only when they have to be discussed as it pertains to Judah, the southern kingdom. Like in times of war, or, uh, you know, a few times like that. Why? Because this is focusing on David. Why would it focus on David? Well, you'll see as we go. Because what it's really focusing on is God's covenant with David. Because it's in fulfilling his promises to David that he's going to bring about a savior um, for the world. But, so Chronicles, especially First Chronicles here is about David, and all of Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, is focusing on the continuation of the Davidic line for the fulfillment of promise. But if Samuel and Kings is political history, then Chronicles is religious history. If Samuel and Kings is prophetic authorship, emphasizing the prophetic ministry and moral concerns, then Chronicles is a priestly authorship, emphasizing the priestly ministry and spiritual Concerns. This chart comes from um, Wilkinson and Boa. Um, Ken Boa and what's Wilkinson's name? Uh, Greg, do you know Wilkinson and Boa? You know him. Um, it doesn't matter. It's an excellent book, though. It's called um, Talk Through the Bible, and it gives overviews of each book of the Bible. It's an outstanding resource. Um, if Samuel and Kings is written by authors soon after the events, then Chronicles is written by Ezra, or the chronicler, many years after the events. If Samuel and Kings is more negative, focusing on rebellion and tragedy, remember, Samuel and Kings is speaking to Jews in exile, asking, what happened? And the history says, you happened. Do, like, do you not remember? Here's this record of all of your sins and failings, and God promised to discipline you. And they say, oh yeah, that's right. Well, by contrast, Chronicles is much more positive. It focuses, yes, on apostasy, but hope in spite of tragedy. It's speaking to those that have returned and saying, yes, your land is in rubble in essence, but you can rebuild. 
You have nothing less than the promises of God that he will bless you when you walk before him in repentance and faith. And so Chronicles is much more positive and forward-looking and hopeful than Samuel and Kings. Um, If Samuel and Kings is a message of judgment, Chronicles is one of hope. If Samuel and Kings is about man's failings, then Chronicles is about God's faithfulness. I think that's a good one. And if Samuel and Kings emphasizes kings and prophets, Chronicles emphasizes the temple and the priests. So a bit of a contrast then between them. So now, for the rest of our time, I want to walk through a few key themes um, that you see if you were to read through 1 Chronicles over the next week or so, and I hope that you will. Um, Take the opportunity to challenge yourself and set aside maybe, uh, you know, an hour and a half and, and get a highlighter and a pen and read straight through the book, looking for some of these themes. Um, that's my hope, is that with these messages, you'll go primed um, with new curiosity and some things to look for and read through the book, maybe a few chapters a day or maybe all at once, um, one afternoon. But here's the first theme I want you to see, and it is the idea of breaking faith or forsaking God. Now, as much as we've said that this is generally a positive and hopeful book, there is still this theme of warning throughout. Looking back, individuals, tribes, and ultimately the whole nation experienced judgment because they broke faith with Yahweh or they forsook him. Looking forward, as in David's charge to Solomon, uh, judgment will come or will continue to be the consequence for breaking faith. So let me give you some examples of this. Achan, whose name means trouble. (laughs) Um, He was aptly named, and the text tells us, Achan, the troubler of Israel, who broke faith in the matter of the devoted thing. That's in 2.7. In the middle of this genealogy, just giving name, 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 it says Achan which would already have arrested the Hebrew reader because his name means trouble. And then it basically said the troublemaker, the troubler of Israel, who broke faith in the matter of the devoted thing. And you'll remember Achan, when uh, Israel is occupying the land, they're going in and they're told, destroy everything. This cannot be used for God. This is too tainted by sin and idolatry. Burn it all. Get rid of it. Achan thought, well, surely a little compromise won't, won't hurt. So he took some gold and buried it in his tent, and God had to root this out by lot, and he brought great judgment on Israel. They lost their next battle. Um, people died. It was terrible. And so that is inserted there as a reminder that when you break faith with Yahweh, there is discipline. How about the northern tribes? In 1 Chronicles 5.25, we see they broke the faith with the God of their fathers and whored after the gods of the peoples of the land whom God had destroyed before them. Um, Same language. A few chapters later, of Judah, the southern kingdom, we see that Judah was taken into exile in Babylon because of their breach of faith in 9.1. And then of individuals, we are told of Saul in 1 Chronicles 10, 13 and 14, that Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. And finally, David says to Solomon, and you, Solomon, this is in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9, You, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. So this forsaking or failing to seek God becomes a theme of warning through 2 Chronicles as well, specifically with the language of forsaking God. But the wording is breaking faith in 1 Chronicles. And again, while it's a positive, forward-looking, hopeful book, there's still this note of warning. It's important to remember this because we're also talking about 
um, the promises of God to Abraham, to Moses, to uh, David, and God is promising David, I will establish your throne forever. Someone from your line will sit on your throne after you, and it will be an everlasting reign. But that did not give David or Solomon or anyone in Israel the right to sin. Just because God will be faithful to his word does not mean that we will not be disciplined when we are unfaithful um, before God. And this is what we see throughout these books. All of them in Chronicles is no different. We serve a God of tremendous grace and mercy. And God will fulfill his promise to David. This is the point of the book. And he has fulfilled it in ways we'll talk about as we go. But the individuals involved benefiting from the blessings of this promise are still accountable before God. And so it is for you and I. We can be a part of God's people and benefit tremendously from worshiping alongside brothers and sisters in the family of God and experience the blessings of God's church and the means of grace that he's provided in some corporate ways like baptism and communion and, and um, accountability and love and prayer. But when we begin to sin, when we break faith, when we walk away from the Lord, then God as a loving father will still discipline us. We'll still experience his discipline in that way. Well, that's the first theme, but how about a second The second theme would be the opposite of this, which is seeking God. You might write that down um, at the top in your Bible, at the top of the page at 1 Chronicles. You might write there, um, uh, breaking faith slash seeking God. And then you'll remember to look for those themes when you read through the book in the future. The opposite is also true and particularly emphasized those who seek the Lord through wholehearted and whole-minded obedience and proper worship, will find him and be blessed by him. This is a major theme in 1 Chronicles. I've, I've outlined about four principles under this heading. First, David knew that proper leadership starts with proper worship and exists for the purpose of supporting proper worship. Proper leadership under God begins with proper worship. And proper leadership under God exists for the purpose of supporting proper worship. You can't separate those two. And if you're wondering why our country is sliding as it is, it's because we've aggressively rejected this truth. We're seeing the fruits of it. So early in David's reign, He said, let us bring again the ark of our God to us. For we did not seek it in the days of Saul. But it's important to know that uh, according to the ESV footnote there, it could be translated seek him. We did not seek him in the days of Saul. It wasn't the ark itself that David wanted, but God who desired to be approached at the ark with its mercy seat for making atonement for the sins of the people. Um, David knew uh, under Saul, we long ago set aside the proper worship of Yahweh. The ark is somewhere far away. There's no institutionalized, regular, daily sacrifices happening there. The priests are not ministering before the Lord as they ought to be. We are not going to God and seeking his will regularly. So the very first thing David does, he gets in office and he says, we're going to bring the ark back, meaning we're going to bring Yahweh back to the center of our life as a nation. We're going to seek him. We're going to worship him. We're going to love him. Um, When the people retrieved the ark then from Kiriath-Jerim, They ignored God's specific instructions for moving the ark. David was right. Let's get this thing back. The people who moved it were wrong. They thought we can do the right thing in the wrong way and God will be fine with it because at least we're doing the right thing. And we find that that is not how it works. Faithfulness is fruit. It would have been far more important to them, far more um, valuable and God-honoring For them to take the right steps in transporting the ark and never get it back to Jerusalem. 
because they would have been showing faithfulness to Yahweh. But they ignored God's instructions for having poles through the rings at the base of the ark and carrying it on the shoulders only of those appointed from a particular family, never touching, etc. No, they threw it in the back of a pickup truck, in essence. They took someone's farm truck down. They put it on an ox cart and said, ah, this will be easier, come on. And, um, you know, like, hold my grape juice, you know, what... I mean, this is some redneck stuff because they're like us. Like, let's just get this done. Surely it's not that big a deal. So they put it on an ox cart. Then um, uh, when the people did finally retrieve it, they ignore God's instructions. This cost poor Uzzah his life. They're not taking God seriously. And he thinks when the ox cart stumbles, he can just reach out and grab it because after all, we surely don't want God's ark, God's throne in essence, this meeting place with God. We don't want that falling in the mud. And so he reaches out and grabs hold of it. As though that mud that's been doing exactly what God has commanded it to do since he created it was somehow less offensive than his sinful, rebellious hand. You see how insane our thinking is? There's no sin in that mud. That's not offensive to God. He made it and declared it good. But us, a sinful hand is bad. It is very bad. And when he grabs hold of the ark in high-handed rebellion, ignoring God's direct command, God kills him. He's struck down. Right? You can't walk into one of these uh, um, you know, power stations where they're piping the electricity around and start grabbing hold of the sparky things. It'll kill you. Well, infinitely less can you go grabbing hold of God's ark with your sinful hand. But the people aren't there yet, but they're learning. They learn proper leadership starts with proper worship and exists for the purpose of supporting proper worship. But now in getting the ark, they learn another lesson. Months later, after proper reflection and careful consecration, David sent for the ark again. But this time he explained... Because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. 1 Chronicles 15, 13. Why did this happen? Because we did not seek him according to the rule. David learned another important lesson. God's people must seek him carefully according to his instructions for worship. God's people must seek him carefully according to his instructions for worship. If you look across the land in a broader way, appeared in the windows of churches across the land, you might get the impression that worship is a free-for-all, that anyone can do anything as long as their heart is quote-unquote in the right place. Like Uzzah's? You see? No, God's people must seek him carefully according to his instructions for worship. Do you see how important, just pause, these lessons are for Israel as they're coming back into their land, having already experienced judgment and exile. God is graciously teaching them, you can rebuild here in the land. I will come and be among you. I will be as gracious as I, has ever, as I have ever been, but you have to rebuild the right way. You have to know that your leaders are there to lead you in worship. You have to know that worship is not a free-for-all. You must worship me carefully in the way that I've commanded. God is graciously enabling them to live before him faithfully. So then when the ark was installed in Jerusalem, David appointed Levites to minister before the ark. Um, Chapter 16, verse 5, to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord. Um, He says this in 6.4. Further, he raised up Various musicians, 16, 5, and 6, and singers, and commanded um, in 16, 7 that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord. And then David joined the praise, singing his own song here, singing in part, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. That's 16, 10, and 11. And by the end of chapter 16, David has formally reinstituted daily worship of Yahweh before the ark. 
according to God's commands, including, of course, the sacrifices. Many were called to serve. How did they know who should serve? They're reading the Pentateuch. They're looking, and David is calling them back by families, by clans, saying, get your jobs going. Let's get back to worshiping God. They were called to serve, quote, to do all that is written in the law of the Lord that he commanded Israel. 1640. Now David is sounding like a king in Israel. David had learned a third lesson that the purpose of godly leadership is to ensure proper worship according to God's instruction in an ongoing, uninterrupted way. Worship is not an occasional affair when the people need God. Proper, intense worship is not an affair for when um, uh, foreign armies are mobilizing against Israel. So now, quick, let's dust off the ark and get some calves and call in the the Levites from wherever they are on vacation. Um, This is not a matter of occasional dedication. Um, There's no atheists in foxholes, as they say. Everybody cries out when it hurts enough. But David is learning and walking faithfully in this way, saying, no, we're going to have sacrifices in the morning and in the evening. We're going to do it every day. And we're going to have priests and Levites, and there's going to be singers, and there's going to be musicians, and there's going to be people leading in praise and worship. There's going to be prayers. There's going to be thanksgiving. The smoke will go up continually from this temple now. Uh, They don't have a temple yet, but from this site of worship that they are establishing. Um, It is to be the pulsing heart of the nation. Just as proper worship according to God's instructions on a regular daily basis ought to be the beating heart of your life, of our families, and of our church family together. It's not an occasional affair as we feel most needy, Um, but the rhythm of life. A final uh, lesson under this heading, late in David's life, as he prepared the people to help Solomon build the temple, David said, now, set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God may be brought into a house built for the name of the Lord. The Hebrew word for set here, when he says set your mind and heart to seek the Lord, set means to give or to hand down or hand over. It means to surrender It can even mean to be sacrificed. So David called Israel's leaders, and thereby all her people, to give over or surrender or sacrifice their hearts and minds to seek the Lord their God. Seeking God is a matter of whole life devotion to doing what most pleases him. It's a final lesson for seeking God here this evening. Seeking God is a matter of whole life devotion to doing what most pleases him. Surely the Apostle Paul agreed when he wrote, summarizing all of Romans 1 to 11, um, or at least telling us what we ought to do in light of it, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Doesn't that verse have a whole different ring to it after discussing First Chronicles for a few minutes? When you think about Uzzah, you envision God in his holiness. You envision the tabernacle. You envision the, the ark. You envision worship around it. You envision God judging people for not taking his holiness seriously. You can hear David telling the people with your whole mind and your whole heart, they must be set upon the Lord, given over to him to seek him. All of a sudden, you're ready to read Romans as Paul wrote it. 
Paul was as Jewish as you can be. He was steeped in the traditions. Um, Paul is, is likely thinking of this verse and dozens of others as he pens Romans 12.1. Um, here's a third theme that we should think about as you read 1 Chronicles. God's covenant with David. Now, while there will be judgment for disobedience when necessary, even defeat, subjugation, and exile, as we saw in 1 Chronicles 9.1, God will fulfill his promise to David to establish his throne forever through his offspring. This is a major, major theme through First and Second Chronicles, but we're talking about First Chronicles tonight, David and the temple. Now, through Nathan the prophet, God told David in First Chronicles 17, 10 and following, moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. David was saying, God, I want to build a house for you. And God said, no, I don't need a house that you would build me and your hands are too bloody anyway. But, David, I will build you a house. I will build you an everlasting house. When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. Yes, David, I will have a house, but you're not the temple builder Solomon is. But I will establish his throne forever. Verse 13, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you. Um, but I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established. David would explain in First Chronicles 28, 4 through 7. The Lord God of Israel chose me from all my father's house to be king over Israel forever. For he chose Ju Judah as leader. And in the house of Judah, my father's, my father's house, meaning he chose my father's house out of all of the houses in Judah. And among my father's sons, he took pleasure in me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen Solomon my son, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, It is Solomon your son who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever if he continues strong in keeping my commandments and my rules as he is today. Notice both the permanent... Well, let me keep reading. David's throne would continue to be occupied first through Solomon, but also in an ongoing way forever. That word comes up over and over in these promises. Now, it's important to remember that Chronicles was originally placed last in the Old Testament scriptures. Chronicles was last in what was called um, the, the writings. And so that means that Bible readers in the early church, reading the scripture as it was originally collected, would have finished the Old Testament with Chronicles, especially the theme of God's promise to raise up a king to reign forever from the house of David ringing in their ears. That's the theme that they would have closed their Old Testament thinking about, thinking, I wonder who it will be. I wonder when he will come. Well, when they turned to the New Testament as it was written to continue the story, the very first words they would have read and still would read are this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Chronicles is a book about the royal lineage of David and the promises God made to establish one of his eventual offspring on his throne forever. And that's the last note that a reader of the Old Testament originally would have had ringing in their ears as soon as they opened to the New Testament, a few decades into uh, after Christ's resurrection, 
the New Testament opens with those words, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. So you can look for God's promises to David as you read through the book of Chronicles. And um, finally, fourthly, I want you to see the offer of grace for those who repent. In a meeting place um, with God where sacrifice is made. (laughs) This is the temple. This is what God is doing among his people. Despite the negative and brutal reality of Israel's disobedience to the point of apostasy portrayed in Samuel and Kings, the chronicler reminds us of a wonderful, history-changing, sin-destroying fact that God offers grace to those who repent. He provides the meeting place and the means of atonement to make reconciliation with God possible. In one of David's worst moments as king, he took a census of Israel, apparently seeking to trust in his own military prowess rather than God's miraculous provision. And God judges David and Israel along with him, because that is how God works among his people, um, Israel, by sending an angel of the Lord to kill 70,000 Israelites. This is a dark, dark moment in David's reign. David and his men eventually respond with humility in 1 Chronicles 21, 16, and 17. And then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces before God. And David said to God, was it not I who gave command to number the people? It is I who have sinned and done great evil. But these sheep, meaning the people of Israel, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house, but do not let the plague be on your people. Now David is acting like a leader again. Father, let this judgment be on me and not on them. He's admitting that he is a sinner and that his sin is great. Certainly some parallels here to Psalm 51 written by David in repentance after Nathan the prophet came and convinced him of his sinfulness regarding Bathsheba. He was humble, he was contrite before the Lord. What happens next is that David bought a field from Ornan, the Jebusite. He built an altar and he sacrificed to the Lord. And of course, God is leading him through this process, curiously. God accepted his offering, sent fire from heaven to consume the offering, and then commanded the angel to sheath his sword. The judgment, the discipline abated the minute that David and his elders humbly obeyed the Lord. And as the episode ends, David says, Here shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offering for Israel. That's First Chronicles 22.1. I want you to fix this in your mind. It's very important. In this place where David is currently standing or on his face before the Lord, representing David's humble repentance after God's discipline of his great sin, it is in this place that the temple would be built. The temple was a place where God met with mankind to provide grace and mercy through the means that he appointed through blood sacrifice. You need to fix that in your mind when you think of the great temple that Solomon would go on to build, one of the great wonders of the world. What's far more wonderful, what is more wondrous than the scope of that building was how it came about. You need to envision David terrified, coming undone with some of his key officials out in a field, seeing the angel of the Lord, as it were, suspended between heaven and earth, is what the text said. Having just killed 70,000 people in Israel, David, no doubt, um, uh, trembling, no doubt, he may have been retching. I think he was physically coming unglued. This is David at his lowest, saying, God, help. God, what have I done? God, this is me, not them. Please, me, sacrifice me. What is he saying here? Am I reading into this? God, kill me, not them. Those words aren't in the text, but boy, the, the sentiment seems to be. 
Father, they don't deserve this. I do. Discipline me. And as they fall on their face before God, God listens. And he comes to him and says, right here, this is a good spot. And he goes and he buys the field in this place where he is crying out before God. And he builds this altar and sacrifices and God accepts the sacrifice and turns away his wrath. God's wrath abated because of a blood sacrifice offered by man coming in humble repentance. Now, God led through the whole thing. That ragged field with men that were ashen and shaky, that's where the temple was built. That's where the altar would be throughout the rest of its existence. Why? Because our God is so good. He is so gracious and merciful keeping steadfast love to the thousandth generation, that that's what he does. God provides the meeting place and God provides the means of reconciliation. And as he did it in the Old Testament, he's still doing it today. He's still doing it today. He's meeting with men and women today in his appointed place through his appointed means. That appointed place is the cross and the appointed means is the shed blood of Christ. Hebrews 9, 11 and following says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he, Jesus, entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, if they sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Notice not just to be saved. <laughs> As American watered-down evangelicalism likes to end things. No. No. Let me read it again. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We come to this place now as one of the priests. We come We find forgiveness. We find salvation. We are given God's spirit to live within us, to change us. And now we stand there, not as one cowering in the corner. We stand there as a son or daughter adopted into the family of God, heirs of his limitless grace and priests in his service. That's what happens when God comes to meet with man and provides the means of reconciliation. It's that people like you and me can be servants of God. It's amazing. Verse 15, therefore he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. I'm going to give one more passing comment. Um, And then we'll take some questions. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles 9. Um, In this passage, really the whole book, talking about David, talking about the temple, talking about service, I want you to see 1 Chronicles 9, 28 and following. Here are these people, the gatekeepers, priests with various assignments, but look at verse 28 of 1 Chronicles 9. Some of them had charge of the utensils of service, for they were required to count them when they were brought in and taken out. Others of them were appointed over the furniture and over all the holy utensils and also over the fine flour, the wine, the oil, the incense, and the spices. Others of the sons of the priests prepared the mixing of the spices, And Mattatiah, one of the Levites, the firstborn of Shalom the Korahite, well, he was entrusted with making the flat cakes. Also, some of their kinsmen of the Kohathites had charge of the showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. And he says, now these, the singers, the heads of the fathers' houses, the Levites, 
were in the chambers of the temple, free from other service, for they were on duty day and night. These were heads of the father's houses, the Levites, according to their generations, leaders. These lived in Jerusalem. I want you to see that in all that we've described in this incredible temple and this incredible service before God, um, there are some who are in charge of the utensils. There are some who are on the hospitality team. (laughs) They're doing a little more than that, but not really. They're doing a, a daily, routine, simple task of counting out the utensils being used Um, in the service of the Lord, then counting them back in, cleaning them, storing them appropriately. Um, They're mixing spices, they're making flatbread. Um, These are some really simple, seemingly mundane, daily repetitive tasks. And they are so important to God that he's enshrined them forever in his word. And we need to remember that that any and all service that we render to God or any of his people is that important to him. It's the same. There's no difference. There's no difference between the one standing up front talking or the one, you know, uh, in the back making the coffee or the one that's out fixing things or the one that, that's uh, decorating trees or cleaning the toilets. Yes, thank you, Kate. And um, absolutely. And so I just think that's wonderful. I have that marked in my Bible for a reason. I discovered it. One of the joys of a bad memory is the joy of constant discovery. And I'm always discovering my own handwritten notes that I have no recollection of writing there. Because it was probably 10 years ago, and it probably just hit me in the moment as I was reading through. But that was one that I had to remind myself of in my own handwriting um, recently. And I just, I was encouraged by that. And so I want you to know that. It's so easy to feel unseen, forgotten. What are my gifts, really, you know? Um, God is blessed by those that were counting out and back in the utensils and has written a record of them with some of their names in the scriptures. (laughs) And so how blessed it is to, to serve a God who loves us. Questions? before we end. Let me, let me pray for us, and then we'll take some questions. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this book. Thank you for the, the challenging reminders and the comforting reminders. Father, make us more like David, but more importantly,